and I'm gonna spotlight you. Okay. Great. Well, thanks. If you have questions, please chat them to me. Yeah. So, um, yeah. As I, so three and a half hours of the movie Exodus. I mean, the the book is even longer. It, uh, it's it's a very lengthy tome, which perhaps some of you read. Uh, you may not know that uh, the book Exodus was the best-selling book since Gone with the Wind when it first came out. It, it sold a tremendous number of copies, uh, uh, which doesn't mean that everyone who bought it read it necessarily, but um, but uh, it, it was truly a bestseller. It was actually um, uh, the filmmaker Dory Sherry actually contracted with Leon Uris and, um, and his uh, film company, if you, you may remember Dory Sherry, uh, he was the producer of uh, Gentleman's Agreement that we talked about in, uh, I think, the first week that we met in our part one in this class. So, um, so actually his studio financed Leon Uris to live in Israel and to do research for a, a period of uh, two years um, it, with the idea that Dory Sherry wanted to make a movie like this uh, about um, um, the, uh, the formation of the state of Israel. Uh, interestingly enough, Otto Preminger, who ends up being the director of this movie, uh, was also an independent producer. And uh, he really wanted to make this movie. And so he had to negotiate with Dory Sherry about it. And um, Dory Sherry had... Uh, uh, one of one of Otto Preminger's selling points was I don't have a board of directors to answer to, um, you know I can make this movie, and maybe you can't, right? And, and eventually uh, he was given the permission by Dory Sherry to uh, uh, to make the movie of the book, so um, so kind of an interesting story that he uh, that there was some um, controversy at the time about whether or not. Um, uh, the movie should be made. And so Dory Sherry was taking some heat uh, from his board of directors, I think. So um, so he kind of handed it off and Otto Preminger uh, got to make the movie. Otto Preminger's voice appears in the movie, by the way. I don't know if any of you recognized his voice. He uh, he dubbed in a part. Um, the, uh, on, the, on the ship, there is one particular guy, the guy, he's playing chess most of the time, right? Uh, uh, but he gets to speak out here and there about uh, hunger strikes and things like that. That's the voice of Otto Preminger. Uh, Preminger had, had done a lot of acting um, earlier in his uh, career, but, um, but for some reason in, in the movie, he didn't cast himself in the role, but he dubbed the voice in afterwards. So um, uh, if it, you know, people recognize Otto Preminger's voice from a variety of different places. Uh, for me, personally, uh, it's the old Batman TV series where he played Mr. Freeze. So one of the uh, the bad guys who was later played by Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie. But um, so the voice of Otto Preminger is, is kind of unmistakable. Um, so uh, we have, uh, 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 so the movie's made in 1960. It didn't win a whole lot of Oscars. Uh, it was nominated for a couple of things. Let me see if I can find my notes on that page. Um, so uh, had um, uh, let's see the the I think the only thing it won was for its uh, soundtrack for the music. Right? So um, if memory serves uh, properly, but. Um, no, it was nominated for cinematography, which it lost uh, to Spartacus, which came out the same year. Uh, it won for best score. Uh, Sal Minio was nominated, but they also lost to Spartacus in that category. Uh, Peter Ustinov uh, won that year for his role in Spartacus. Um, it's interesting. You may have noticed the, the screenplay link um, that um, uh, Dalton Trumbo is credited as adapting the book by Leon Uris. And Dalton Trumbo was one of uh, the Hollywood 10, one of the people who had been blacklisted in Hollywood back in the 1950s. So this movie, along with the other movie that Dalton Trumbo wrote that year, uh, which was Spartacus, 
uh, are credited with breaking the blacklist in Hollywood. A lot of the movies that we uh, have talked about have related in one way or another to the um, to the blacklist, uh, and so uh, we'll see a few more as our time together goes on. But so th this movie is significant uh, um, just for that, for actually acknowledging the writer Dalton Trumbo. Uh, he continued to write screenplays. Uh, some of them were actually nominated for Oscars during his time on the blacklist, but under assumed names. So, um, so uh, Kirk Douglas, who of course starred in Spartacus and starred in the movie that we saw last week, plays a big role in helping to break that blacklist along with Otto Preminger here. So uh, it, it's not surprising that Trumbo with his uh, political leanings was interested in, um, in the story of the state of Israel. And the story of the state of Israel is he, he loved Israel's socialist government, right? And, and uh, Israel was founded in 1948 as, as a socialist state with its labor party in control for uh, the first 30 years or so of Israel's existence. So, um, so it was uh, a natural actually for Dalton Trumbo to, uh, to think about these things. So uh, as we mentioned already, it was directed by Otto Preminger. Um, Otto Preminger is uh, of uh, Jewish heritage. He was born in Austria in 1905. Um, um, Actually, I, I believe he was born in the Ukraine. His family moved to Austria, but he claimed later in life to be Austrian. Um, he was involved in theater in Germany and Europe. Uh, he took over for Max Reinhardt uh, as the director of a very famous theater company and, um, and moved to, to America in 1936. And um, he had thought of himself as a stage director primarily but um, he started making movies. I, I think he made one in Europe before coming to America. And then um, when he made, came to America, he became a very well-known and, and very successful director. Um, a, as a director, I'm, I'm not sure that Exodus is his best work. I mean, if, you, if you're a, a film aficionado and you're interested in uh, um, you know, his best, best directed films, you might think about uh, some of the film noir movies that he made. He made a, a wonderful uh, film noir called Where the Sidewalk Ends in 1950. He was nominated for the Oscar for direction, I think three times over his career, not for this movie. Um, he The first one was his first movie actually, which was uh, uh, kind of a film noir as well, Laura in 1944. Um, he also made movies that dealt with subjects that uh, um, not many other film directors were doing at the time. I mean, his movie, The Man with the Golden Arm, uh, about uh, heroin addiction. Um, he, he makes a great courtroom movie called Anatomy of a Murder, which deals uh, with, with rape in a very frank kind of way. Uh, his movie, Advise and Consent, deals with homosexuality and uh, uh, the the uh, you know for many years if you wanted to work in government and you had you you still have to go through of course security clearance but one of the uh, things that would disqualify you was homosexuality because of the fear that you could be uh, blackmailed by other foreign governments um, that's not obviously so true anymore as people can be um, out of the closet. Uh, but um, but the movie Advice and Consent deals with that. He also uh, was a master of the widescreen format in bigger movies. Um, a, a personal favorite of mine is River of No Return with Robert Mitchum and uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, which spends a lot of time with, on a river raft. And Otto Preminger direct that as well. So um, so a very accomplished director and and uh, certainly. Um, his direction is, is very good in this movie. Um, it's just such a big sprawling three and a half hour movie, you know, that uh, um, it was a huge epic in its time. It probably did play with an intermission. I mean, some DVDs, uh, for instance, the DVD of Fiddler on the Roof retains the intermission. 
I don't think that, um, I know that the DVD of Exodus does not. So, but, but most likely it played with an intermission. Spartacus played with an inter intermission. It was not so unusual in those days to, uh, to have an intermission in the middle uh, Alan the, said that her DVD had an intermission. Oh, did it? Uh, it did not in mine. So there may be some different. Uh, They've updated and took out the intermission. Movies. So uh, I would say that this movie plays out in three acts, in a sense, right? I mean, act one is uh, Cyprus and the ship, the Exodus itself. Act two goes up until the, uh, the, uh, the bombing of the prison in, in Akko and the the escape of those prisoners and then act three is kind of the the um uh, proclamation of the state of israel and the uh defense of gandafna and and that act so uh in in a sense i think the the movie plays out that way um you know it, it, some critics at the time talk about how it takes an hour for the movie to start right the, that uh they see that hour in uh, Cyprus as being an hour long introduction to uh, to the rest of it. Uh, I don't I don't think that's really fair, to be honest. I mean, I think that that you know these three acts, in a sense, are are three equal parts. We can talk about that a little bit uh, more as we go as well. I want to mention, of course, Paul Newman. Um, Paul Newman, uh, his father was Jewish, and he said that he took this role in part as a, an homage to his father, who died, I think, shortly before this movie was made. Um, but he also described himself as a Jew throughout his life. Uh, he's quoted as saying that he's a Jew because it's more of a challenge. Um, so, but that's uh, um, uh, Paul Newman. He's certainly not the only Jewish actor in this movie. Lee J. Cobb, who plays his father in the movie, his real name is Leo Jacoby. So uh, changed to J. Cobb um, for the, uh, the movies. Came from a Jewish family, he was born in the Bronx. Um, uh, had a couple of Oscar nominations uh, of his own. Certainly uh, his most familiar one is for uh, uh, the crime boss in, on the waterfront. Um, but he was also nominated for his role in the Brothers Karamazov uh, in the early 60s. So um, pretty well-known actor. Um, uh, among the others, uh, I don't think there are any other Jews in major roles here. Um, there is um, the, the one who plays Lee J. Cobb's brother. They sometimes refer to him as the old man, um, Joseph Opetat. Opatashu was a well-known Yiddish actor uh, appearing on the Yiddish, Yiddish stage and in Yiddish movies in the 19th and 1930s and 40s. And I think has a, a remarkable and a pivotal part in this movie and, and uh, brings a, a lot of heart and, and um, power into his scenes. Um, uh, so let's see, do I have any other notes on Joseph Opatashu? I don't think Okay, so. there I have Lee J. Cobb up. Yeah. Now what's his brother's name? Opatashu. O P A. O P A S H. O P A T A S H. Okay. Just an S. Uh, the last letter is U. Oh, is this him? Oh, there he is, right? Right, that's him. Hell yeah. So you can see him, uh, you know, he had a, a, a pretty distinguished career himself, but uh, there he is, um, uh, you know, around the age that he was in this movie, uh, playing the head of the Irgun, right? Um, which, which uh, you know, so so this movie is is based on some factual things, but unlike uh, Cast a Giant Shadow, you wouldn't even call this a true story, right? The the uh, the Ben Kanan family here, you know, is the the leader of leaders of the Haganah, leaders of the uh, uh, of the Irgun, uh, and also the kind of stand-in for David Ben Gurion. 
right? So, um, so all three of those people coming from one family, that's, that's a fiction created by Leon Uris, but it's, uh, um, uh, it's an interesting storytelling device to have these two brothers, Lee J. Cobb and uh, David Opatashu as um, uh, brothers who are estranged because of their different ways of dealing with the British mandate. So um, to mention a few other people, um, so we talked a little about Paul Newman. Um, you may know he was nominated for many Oscars before he received one. Uh, he's one of the few actors to have been nominated for an Oscar in five different decades, uh, which is a kind of an amazing thing if you think about it. Um, I, I believe he shares that only with uh, Laurence Olivier, Michael Caine, and Jack Nicholson. Um, so, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, no one has been nominated for an Oscar in six decades. But um, we'll, we'll see, I guess. No. But, um, uh, and that's actually, he missed a decade. Uh, he had no nominations in the 1970s, although he made a pr some pretty good movies in the 1970s, including The Sting, but he wasn't nominated uh, that year. So. Uh, Eva Marie Saint, I think, is still alive. She'd be 96 years old, um, but I don't remember seeing her obituary. Perhaps someone else has a better memory of that than I do. She, uh, she, won died, the in, she died in 2016. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so still lived to a ripe old age. She won an Oscar for On the Waterfront, so she and Lee J. Cobb were both in that movie in the 1950s. I think that movie uh, was her introduction to this. Um, and uh, so certainly had a long and gloried career out in Hollywood. Uh, Sal Min Minio was nominated for Exodus. I, I think uh, he was also nominated for Rebel Without a Cause, if memory serves. Um, uh, he unfortunately died young. He was murdered uh, in what was probably just a regular mugging in, uh, in Los Angeles. There was some scuttlebutt uh, around it, but I, I think in the end, it turns out to have been random, um, but unfortunately uh, died young. But of course his heyday was in, in these early years, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, in the 70s, he played one of the apes in the uh, Planet of the Apes movies. So, um, so um, a couple of other people who are worth noting, I, I think Ralph Richardson and Peter Lawford in the first hour of the movie, and then of course completely disappear from it. But, the, uh, but both of them uh, are remarkable. Um, Ralph Richardson, who uh, was nominated twice for an Oscar himself, um, but plays a largely thankless role here as kind of a, a, a you know, his job is mostly exposition, you know, telling the story of the British uh, mandate. Uh, so um, so uh, he rarely gets to show anything of his acting range, I think, in this movie, but, but he still um, uh, it, it does it credi creditably. Uh, Peter Lawford, on the other hand, I think is probably better in this than anything else he was ever in. I, I mean, he's best known for his connections to the Rat Pack and being an in-law to John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Teddy Kennedy, you know, by marrying their sister. So he's, he's less known uh, for his acting than, you know, he's one of those people who's famous for being famous. But, but I think he very credibly puts across the, this idea of an anti-Semitic British officer in Cyprus. Um, you know, he's quite, uh, quite natural at it, um, it which it was, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's because he could act. Right? So, but, but it's, it, you know, he just is, is quite good in this, I think. So worth mentioning. The other person we just have to have to mention, I mean, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think this movie could not be made today. It could not be made uh, with the same story that it was made with back then, but certainly some of the casting decisions would be uh, questionable. We talked about Topol playing a Bedouin last week. John Derrick playing the uh, sheikh in the Arab village in this movie. I mean, that's uh, uh, highly unlikely. Uh, again, John Derrick is not uh, necessarily a household name other than the fact that he was married to Bo Derrick um, and, and was sort of her 
Svengali in Hollywood uh, for a number of years. Um, so, um, so he plays the, uh, you know, you can, there's a picture of him in some biblical epic there that you've got. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what that is. Um, I don't know, but <laughs> quite but, the costume. Right. But, uh, you but, know, oh, it's the 10 commandments. He must've yeah, played he, Jewish a lot. It. Okay. So, yeah. So he had a, a, you know, never, never won an Oscar, never nominated for an Oscar. He has been nominated for a number of what they call Razzies, which are the award for the worst uh, actors and worst performances uh, the nominated for several things that he did with, with his uh, wife at the time, Bo Derek, uh, worst writer and worst director in Hollywood. So, uh, you know, there's some, uh, uh, you know, you can have a sense of humor about that stuff. And I think he did so, but um, so th there's a few other people you may have noticed George Maharis going by um, early on, um, uh, not a huge star, but he was a big tele television star and one of the Wait. stars with Ooh, Mark Miller of Route 66. What was his name? Maharis, M-A-H-A-R-I-S. So, and I do want to mention the uh, the op the credits themselves. I mean, the the credit credit sequence um, it, it is something that you know you don't see as often in movies anymore at all. Um, so, uh, so there's a kind of a heyday for movie credits, and Saul Bass, who designed the credits for Exodus. Uh, it almost single-handedly created that art form. And, and I would say that it is an art form and it's worth thinking about. Uh, some filmmakers in recent years have brought it back almost like an homage to the movies of this time period uh, that had these, these credit sequences in the 50s and the 60s. Remember, if, if you go back and look at some of the older movies, you'll see that you know credits are often projected like uh, um, on, a, on a theater curtain or something like that. You know, just sort of an opening panel with credits, and you'll have a few of those um, pages of credits and stuff, uh, and then the curtain rises and the movie begins, right? So sort of borrowed from theater and things like that. But Saul Bass has this idea that the credits themselves can enhance the story of the movie and can really tell you something about it. So, um, so he created a. He, he actually worked with, with Otto Preminger a fair amount. He worked with Alfred Hitchcock. He, uh, he did the credits for, uh, uh, for Hitchcock. He did um, Psycho and North by Northwest and I think Vertigo. Um, so I see in the chat that I was right, that Eva Marie Saint is still with us. Yeah, she like, still, it was her husband who died in 2016. Okay. So... Um, you know, but Saul Bass, uh, uh, you know, created these memorable credits, uh, some of which you remember if you think about Psycho. I mean, you might think about these words kind of coming together and flying apart. It's sort of symbolic of the, uh, the mental state of the character uh, that played by Anthony Perkins. Um, he did uh, the credit sequence for Otto Preminger. He did the, the one for the man with the uh, golden arm, uh, which is a, a paper cutouts. Uh, ragged pieces of paper and stuff uh, that kind of make up the arm, uh, right, which relates to the heroin addiction and those kinds of things. So what was the credit sequence in this movie? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a little different, but um, if you remember, it's a blue screen with white writing and a flame, right? And the flame starts small and gradually widens out to the whole frame uh, as the movie goes on. I think it's open to some interpretation, but there are a couple of things I'd point out <clears throat> up front. Uh, blue and white, right? I mean, that's a, that's a very, very deliberate choice, I think, here, the colors of the flag of the state of Israel, right? I, I think that that's, uh, that's very clear. The flame uh, can be interpreted a, a few different ways, I think, right? I mean, I, you know, you might think of the eternal flame, right? The ner tamid, the eternal light. Um, the, uh, um, you know, the immortality of the Jewish people. I, I think that's possible. 
Uh, you might also interpret it as coming out of the flames, the blue and white coming out of the flames, the birth of the state of Israel from the, the flames of Europe uh, and uh, the Shoah. I, I think that's possible as well. You might think about the burning bush, right? A flame that burns and, and doesn't consume the screen, right? Uh, um, you know, so you can think about some that kind of imagery as well. Uh, or you can think about uh, the the you know, part of this movie is about war and its victims and its aftermath. Uh, so you may think of the flames in, in a more general sort of sense, right? I mean, there, there's a um, the movie doesn't end with the end of the uh, the war of independence. It ends at the beginning of the war of independence. And so there's a sense that those flames are yet to come. In the sense, and by 1960, of course, there had not only been uh, the War of Independence, but the Suez Crisis in the 1950s. Um, there was already that sort of constant um, sense of enmity between Israel and uh, the neighboring uh, countries. So um, that sense of, of the the spread of the fire of war, in a sense, might be uh, worth thinking about too. So to the best of my knowledge, she never said that this is exactly what, that any of these was exactly what he has in mind. But I do think that it does serve as a kind of an introduction into the, the world of the film. And um, so I, I think it's, a, 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 it's worth noting the, the title sequence because as I've said, so many movies these days don't even have one, right? So, uh, so very thoughtful. So, um, so tell you about the movie. I found, the, I found the title sequence. Did you want to show that? I, I don't think I, I want to okay. take time to show it. I think everybody's seen it. And, oh, and I'll and, put it in the chat. Yeah. So, so, um, so, uh, I want to talk about the title itself for a moment. I mean, the, there, there's an obvious uh, analogy in the title, Exodus. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, so starting, of course, with the story of, of the ancient Israelites coming into the Holy Land, right, uh, leaving Egypt, um, you know, and, and uh, coming to the Holy Land. So there's that Exodus. Uh, and then, of course, in the movie itself, there's the, uh, the merchant ship, which is renamed Exodus, uh, the, the bringing of the refugees from uh, Europe to Cyprus and from Cyprus to Haifa, um, you know, so that, that's very clear. But I would suggest, just as I suggested, that the movie takes place in three acts, that each of them is their own kind of escape, right? And, and that many of the characters, in a sense, are also going through a kind of an exodus of their own, right, from their own uh, um, uh, histories, their own backgrounds, their own experience. So that, that even the, you might think of the character that Eva Marie Saint plays, right? The young widow who, um, you know, has no place to be as this movie begins. I mean, she is also uh, rootless. I mean, she's talking to Ralph Richardson about, you know, she, uh, she'll go to India, she might go here, she might go there. Uh, having lost her husband young, she, uh, um, is 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 needs an exodus from where she is, right? And so, so I'm, I, so looking at that in its broadest sense, right? Uh, we have the two young people, right, played by Sal Minio and by the uh, young actress who uh, um, plays uh, Karen in the movie. Um, you know, didn't didn't have a long or illustrious career in Hollywood. Um, she. Uh, mostly played, uh, she's actually in a few horror movies and things like that. Um, she's uh, a lot of TV appearances, but um, uh, didn't um, really become a big star. But, but she obviously has an experience of the Shoah in Europe that she is making an exodus from, different from the one that her partner, in a sense, in the movie, Dove Landau, played by Sal Minio, makes. Um, but also, of course, you know, he's carrying a tremendous weight, as we hear in the uh, um, 
the the scene where he joins the Irgun and, and is forced to tell his whole truth to them, right? So it's uh, very much a uh, um, uh, an exodus, if you will, right? That the the taking at him being taken out of oneself, in a sense. Uh, Ari Ben Kanan has a backstory as well that he's he's moving from. They they tell the story of this youth village, uh, Gan Dafna, which again is a, a fictional place. Uh, there is a kibbutz Dafna in Israel, but it's not the, the same as this. Uh, this is a, a youth village. And there were several youth villages actually uh, um, uh, that, uh, and a couple of which are still sort of uh, in existence in Israel. Um, they were uh, essentially built as places for, as this movie describes, refugees from Eastern Europe, children without parents. Uh, the Israel needed a place for them to be, where they could be educated and taken care of uh, until they were at the age of majority. So nowadays, uh, the youth villages are a little more like, uh, um, uh, what are they called here? More like juvenile halls, in a sense. They, they, they're sort of orphanages, but they're also sort of like kids get sent there. Um, you know, when they're having some societal issues and societal trouble. Um, but so the, so some of them still exist. Um, in 1974, I spent a couple of weeks with my confirmation class when I was in 10th grade in uh, going into 11th grade, I guess, uh, in uh, staying in one of those youth villages. Actually, there, there was uh, some room for us uh, in those days. So we we spent a couple of weeks there actually, um, uh, touring from there. But uh, uh, so Gan Dafna doesn't exist, but so the backstory of Ari Ben Kanan's character is that he was in love with Dafna, who becomes uh, one of the first martyrs in, uh, in the uh, British mandate Palestine. Right? So, um, so I, I think, um, that you know, many of the characters are dealing with this kind of uh, coming out of themselves and exodus. We have the literal sort of breaking out from Cyprus to Haifa, right, as an exodus. But then in Act Two, the breaking out of the prison, right, is another kind of exodus. So I, I think there's a through line here that that's worth thinking about in the structure of the movie is the individual characters having their own exodus, the movie um, creating these exodus moments. Uh, act three, it's perhaps a little harder to define as an exodus, I think, I mean, this, uh, uh, the defense of the, the youth village and uh, what that means. But, but I would say that it's, you know, for, the, uh, for Preminger and for Yuris and for the, the you know, this is the breaking out of the state of Israel, right? I mean, this is this is the ultimate exodus, the um, um, you know the the uh, stepping out from the British mandate and into nationhood, right? Is an exodus of another kind, right? So so I'd say each of uh, each of these um, uh, acts has its own kind of exodus story that's being told and retold as the movie goes on. There's, uh, um, and then we can get into sort of the particular scenes and particular uh, moments in the movie of which I, uh, you know, at three and a half hours, it's probably too long. Uh, there's probably some things that could have been streamlined. Um, you know, some uh, whole characters that probably don't even really need to exist. Um, but uh, there are also some incredible scenes in this movie, I think. Um, you know, the, the action scenes are fine. They're, they're uh, perhaps better directed than, uh, uh, than what we saw last week, um, you know, more credibly done when, when they happen. But, um, but, but it's really some of the smaller, more personal scenes that I, I find moving in this movie. I mean, I, I, I certainly uh, um, find uh, the, the scenes, uh, the scene where uh, Ari Ben Kanan visits his uncle, the head of the Irgun, and they sit together and have a cup of tea. Um, that, that 
scene is, is extraordinary. And I, I think it's also, it's one of the scenes that, that I, I like to say about this movie. I'm, and yeah, it kind of tells the official story uh, of the birth of the state of Israel, but at the same time, it says some of this stuff in a very impolitic way. Uh, that if you were to make this movie again today, I don't think you would have a character saying the things that he says in that scene, uh, a justification for terrorism uh, that he makes, right? Um, you know, uh, it, I have a couple of notes on this that, um, uh, you know, Ari Ben Kanan says, to, when you attack, it's just to spread terror. Uh, and um, the response that his uncle as the head of the Irgun makes, right, his uncle Akiva, um, by the way, probably not an unconsidered choice, that name Akiva, right, uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva is considered to be one of the great, the greatest, maybe the greatest rabbi, I mean, certainly right up there with Rabbi Hillel, uh, the greatest rabbis of, of Jewish history, but he was also uh, a sponsor of the uh, uh, the last revolt against Rome, um, the, the Bar Kokhba rebellion. So, uh, so Akiba is probably a, a telling choice in terms of the name here. But so uh, Ari Ben Kanan says to him, "When you attack, it's just to spread terror." And in his response, I, I think is fascinating. It, it's um, it says. Uh, I can't think of one nation that was not born in violence to start with. So it says, okay, that's, that's how this is done. So, um, and then they, they, he has the, this, he goes through this list, kind of a litany about it. He says, uh, first, justice is an abstraction. And to talk about justice and Jews in the same breath is a logical fallacy. Um, Third, you could argue the justice of Arab claims as easily as Jewish claims to this land. And, and, and this is, so this is the, where I'm saying there's this kind of impolitic answer here that, you know, uh, I mean, this is not something that, uh, um, that you're likely to find, uh, you know, from, from many Jews today, right? Uh, and then he goes on to say, but, Jews have had more than their share of injustice lately. Let the next injustice work against someone else for a change. I, I mean, it, it's it's pretty fascinating, you know. And like I said, so if you were to remake Exodus today, I'm not sure that that's you would have a character talk like that. I mean, that is a very honest, uh, I would say, a very honest uh, um, statement of of how people felt and continue to feel in a certain sense about the birth of the state of Israel, right? Um, that, uh, yeah, it's unjust, okay? But we've had plenty of un uh, injustice in, uh, in, in the Jewish community. Um, you know, it, it's our turn to have something uh, like this work in our favor, right? Um, it, it's pretty interesting when you think about it. So that scene for me is is very small, but very important, and and perhaps more important than any of the kind of action sequences, you know, the the bombing of the prison. I mean, it's all all done very credibly, well, but uh, you know, it's it's um, not as affecting and moving, I think, as some of these scenes. I find the scene where Salminio uh, joins the uh, joins the Irgun. Uh, and has to tell his story about uh, um, being a capo in Auschwitz and uh, and how yeah and maybe not not an accident that the, this wonderful Yiddish actor appears in both of those scenes, uh, gently drawing that story out of him by you know forcing the the truth out of him, but um, you know with this sort of strong and gentle hand in a way. Uh, and then swearing him into the Irgun, right? It's uh, um, a very interesting uh, scene as well that I, I find uh, very moving and really speaks, of course, to the injustice that was done to our people in Europe uh, and the kind of damage that some of those people brought with them uh, as new immigrants to the state of Israel. 
So, um, so I find uh, some of those scenes very, very powerful. Um, there, there's some nice lines in other places. Um, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear what you guys think about the movie. Um, but, uh, but there, there's certainly. I, I think I, I think the scene that that uh, almost everybody remembers is Paul Newman and and Peter Lawford, in that scene. Uh, where Peter Lawford and his casual anti-Semitism is saying he can spot a Jew, you know, a mile away, uh, in which Paul Newman asks him, would you just look into my eye? I think I've got a cinder, right? Uh, you know, the movie does not have a lot of humor <laughs> in it, but here and there, we have these moments. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, that that's, that's one that, uh, uh, that that sticks in everybody's mind, I think, when they think about this movie. So, d do you guys have some favorite scenes or thoughts you'd like to suggest about it? Feel free to unmute. I'd like to go to the very end of the movie and oh. the scene with John Derrick and supposedly a German. Who yeah. He's bringing 80 men with him to train the Arabs, and right. he had a relationship with the Grand Mufti. Is that true? To the best of my knowledge, there is no truth to that story. Uh, what there, what is true is that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem spent World War II uh, in Italy and Germany, uh -huh. right? because uh, you know the the uh, British mandate was was there. So, so his connection to the Nazis is definitely clear. Um, we also know that, uh, I mean, it goes back to World War I and the uh, uh, relationship between uh, um, you know, the, the Kaiser and, and the Turks in World War I, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire, that the actual introduction of European style anti-Semitism into uh, the Middle East and into Islam takes place in, in that time period in World War I. Uh, the translation of things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion into Arabic uh, occurs during, during World War I, uh, which begins to sort of fertilize the territory for this, uh, um, the, this uh, the, for the growth of anti-Semitism. Uh, without that happening, I'm not sure you'd have a leader in Iran today who denies that the Holocaust happened. Right. Uh, and th those, uh, those seeds are sown in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, they're a part of, uh, uh, of uh, Islamic nationalism in some sense, but, but the, that kind of anti-Semitism didn't really exist in Islam uh, prior to the 20th century. We think back to when we talk about the, uh, the golden age for Jews in Spain, when we talk about the golden age of Spain, we're talking about Islamic Spain, right? When, when the uh, Muslims are in charge of Spain and North Africa, that's when Jews do best in, in Europe, right? Um, in, in those parts of Europe that are, that are under Islamic rule. Uh, Jews rise in, in prominence in various fields. They're, they're poets and philosophers and doctors. Um, you know, they're military officers in the, the uh, Islamic military. Um, you know, it, it's a, uh, um, as we say, it's the golden age, right? So, um, so there's a shift that takes place in the Islamic world. Uh, and you can trace it to World War I, in a sense. Uh, so, so that particular character, that's, that's one that I would point at and say, you know, I'm not sure that really added something important to the, the movie. Um, it, it's interesting, and there's no question that that kind of imported uh, anti-Semitism takes root in, in some of these uh, um, Islamic rule countries, um, some more than in others uh, over the years. Um, but um, but it, it's, uh, um, it, as best I can tell, that particular character is an invention. Um, we have Ed and then Elaine. Ed, go ahead. Uh, just uh, a light comment. Uh, 
Uh, I speak for uh, my wife, uh, Judy Biederman. She's not in the room at the moment, but her great comment watching this was uh, she looked at Paul Newman and said, wasn't he a gorgeous hunk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, that's quite a deliberate thing, right? I'm, you know, we, uh, and we shouldn't gloss over it or make too, too, uh, uh, too light of it, right? I mean, changing the image of the Jew I mean, that, the state of Israel deliberately, very deliberately, right? I mean, this move from the city to the land to becoming a farmer. I mean, the, Ari ben Kanan's father, the, the David Ben-Gurion surrogate character here, the movie, right? And Ben-Gurion too, I mean, both, you know, the, did have a European name that he changed to a Hebrew name when he came to Israel, right? The, those strong Hebrew names like ben Canaan. Uh, um, you know, uh, and Ben Gurion, right, are uh, are the names that they've chosen. Uh, uh, Goldie Meyerson becomes Golda Meir, right. I, I mean, these these things are quite deliberate, but also the, the, this idea of the Jew as, as um, not a tailor, you know, not a uh, <coughs> bookkeeper, right. The Jew as as, as a farmer. <clears throat> the Jew is a soldier, and uh, the Jew is the handsome leading man. Right? Is is not uh, uh, not an accident. Right. So, um, and you know, a, a very worthwhile point, and I, I think important to note. You know, uh, they went for the best they could get. Right, Paul Newman. So, I think he was about thirty-five when he made this movie. By the way, wow. I I just felt like at the very end, I, I felt like the ending was really underwhelming for having watched this long movie. It felt like it needed a bigger ending to me. It was like, okay, and now we're just going to drive away. Right. right. Well, they are in theory driving off to battle, right? right. Driving off to the, the war of, of independence. Uh, I mean, that that's Sort of peculiar. All those trucks seem to be empty, but um, you know, uh, shouldn't they be filled with the soldiers? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a little odd, but um, I, I don't know if that's a deliberate choice or not. Uh, that part, uh, but I think you're right in a sense that the movie doesn't give us that sort of last catharsis that you might expect. Right? Yeah, it wasn't satisfying. The ending, I thought. Yeah. I think it's interesting, though, and, and this is where I'd like to compare it a little bit to the ending of Cast a Giant Shadow from last week, where, you know, we have the catharsis of the, uh, the, the liberation of Jerusalem, right, of West Jerusalem, you know, um, a, a true story in a sense, but, uh, you know, so that making it possible so that when the, uh, the truce takes place, West Jerusalem is a part of the state of Israel and not isolated within, um, you know, uh, the territory of Jordan, as it turns out, uh, after the, uh, the truce, uh, right? So a uh, land that was, of course, supposed to be part of a uh, Palestinian state becomes part of Jordan in 1948. Um, so it's, uh, um, so we have that catharsis followed by that episode of, you know, the main character is killed in, you know, in friendly fire. And so that the last scene of that movie takes us from the catharsis right back into a burial, uh, into the death of, uh, of a character. And, and in that sense, there, there's, I think, a similarity between the ending of these two movies. Uh, and both of them end with sort of the, this note of tragedy um, and, and even uh, uh, there, there may be a little more hope at, at the end of this one, right? A kind of an idea that I mean, it's, uh, the, the last speech, I think that, uh, um, let's see if I can, if I have this. So I, you know, after, at, at the burial, uh, Paul Newman says, this is Taha Mukhtar of Abu Yesha. And this is Karen, secretary of the rooms committee, bungalow 12 in Gandafna. And there, there's this sense, which is a very Jewish sense, that in death, we're all equal, right? 
there's no difference between the Mukhtar of Abu Yesha and the secretary of the rooms committee, right? They're buried side by side in a grave together. Um, uh, not the nameless graves that our people endured in Europe, but named, a named grave, right? Um, and um, uh, Ari calls this uh, uh, senseless, senseless killing, the two of them. He says, with the world's insanity and our own slaughtered millions, we should be used to senseless killing, but I'm not used to it. And he says, the day will come when Arab and Jew will share in a peaceful life, uh, will share in a peaceful life this land that they have always shared in death, right? Um, so, uh, so I think the movie deliberately doesn't give you the catharsis that you're asking for and leaves you with this sense of, of a project that's unfinished. And I think that that's interesting because in 1948, in a certain sense, you might have thought the project was finished, right? Um, of course, the war does not end with a, uh, um, a peace agreement. It ends with a truce. So um, I, I think Alice and I, we were emailing about this a little bit uh, after last week's movie that, um, you know, because of that, uh, you know, saying when that war, when the war of independence ends, and when another war starts or when peace starts, and it, we don't have an answer to those questions because there's, there's never been a, you know, a comprehensive peace agreement, right? So we, Israel now has peace agreements with uh, Egypt and with Jordan um, and normalization agreements with some other countries that uh, either didn't exist back in 1948, like the UAE, um, uh, and Oman, um, or weren't so directly involved in uh, Middle Eastern wars like Morocco. So we have these normalization agreements. We have a couple of peace agreements, but there's still this sort of, you know, when does one war end and another start? Um, you know, it's uh, so the movie by 1960, perhaps there there is a sense of that, right? That there isn't this completion that happens, this catharsis that happens in 1948. So while it's not the most exciting ending, you know, and I, I would agree with that, I, I think it might be a deliberate ending. I mean, I, I think it's deliberately keeping that um, ambiguous and open and hoping that one day there'll be a, an ending to this story, you know, a positive ending. Um, we have two um, people with their hands up, Brenda and then Alice. Brenda, go ahead. Okay, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going off in a different direction here. Um, was, it certainly seemed like there was a large cast, so this must have been a big budget movie. And at the same, the same year, they, they did Ben-Hur, which seemed to take a whole lot of awards and that was also, was this typical for 1960? Well, uh, on, only in the sense that I think uh, uh, the rivalry between movies and movie theaters and television was really in its heyday, right? And, and the question was, how do you get people to come out of their house and go to a movie? And so the answer was, the movie has to be big. <laughs> you know, it has to be, a you know, uh, and, and you see this all through the, the 50s and into the 60s, right up, up till probably around 1970, where I think, uh, you know, Hollywood and, and TV uh, find some way to coexist, right, uh, going forward from there. But so a lot of big budget, big screen movies. And, and I think we still have that sensibility a little bit today. I mean, at least I know CLN and I think about this before back in the days before COVID, when you decide whether or not to go to a movie, you decide what do we need to see on a big screen, right? What's a big movie, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, so some of the movies we've enjoyed most over the last few years are not the big movies. They're, yeah. they're small movies that you can watch on your TV screen and not really lose anything. But the choices we make for going out would uh -huh. be for something big. And so I think that's why you get movies like 
I, I mean, it's not the only reason you get movies like Ben Hur and Spartacus and uh, and this one around this time, but it's yeah. certainly a part of it. So, um, and and um, people were willing to back movies of that size because they thought that, well, if it's a big enough movie, people will actually come out for it. Lawrence of Arabia is right around this time too, another big, uh, big screen movie. And in fact, the format for this movie, I'm not sure what the different uh, versions that people saw on Voodoo and things like that. Um, on, on the DVD I have, it's not only letterboxed, which, you know, is familiar. No, it's actually a wider format than that. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I think, in the 70 millimeter, uh, which is more like Cinerama. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not only letterboxed at the top and the bottom, but on the sides too, in, in the version that I have, uh, to make sure you get the entire image of the movie uh, in, in its scope. Uh, there may be some other versions of it out there that don't do that. So. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment on the character that Eva Maria Saint played, Kitty. Um, I thought there was an interesting, you know, showing of she was anti-Semitic and then she wasn't. I mean, they, they showed her evolution of that. Kind of reminded me, Rabbi, of uh, the character in Gentleman's Agreement, that woman. Yeah. A little, you know how she changed, you know, under different circumstances. Right. And also I think that goes to the end where even Maria Saint was, you know, staying. She it seemed like she was gonna be with Ari and she was gonna live in Israel. I mean, which yeah. at one point she said she would never, you know, live in Israel. So I thought that it the ending, you know, told her story of where she, you know, where she was going. Yeah. Yeah, I just just think about the last couple of images, right? Where uh, Ari Ben Kanan throws dirt into the grave, and so does she. She participates in a Jewish burial ritual. Dove Landau does not. His his anger is overflowing, right? And even there, and I I think that's a, a well considered character choice there. You know, he picks up the shovel and then just plunges it into the ground, right, and walks away with his anger. So. Um, so there is still an exodus that he needs, I think, right? Um, but uh, uh, but that, that's lovely to compare it to the character in Gentleman's Agreement. I like that very much. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, what, what we know about all these kinds of uh, hatreds is that uh, generally speaking, once you get to know somebody, they start to go away. Right, whether it's about we know this about gay rights, we know this about anti-Semitism. So um, uh, she is not the not anti-Semitic the way the Peter Lawford character is, and in fact, it's her encounter with him that changes her mind to begin with. Right, um, you know when when he starts talking about how uh, uh, you know the scuttlebutt about the general that he has, uh, you know, if you shook his family tree, uh, some Jews would fall out right? Um, that that's when she says, you know, I've changed my mind. Tell the general that I'll stick around and, and be a nurse for a few days, right? So she's already humane enough to know that her discomfort is something she should deal with, right? Uh, and she does. Beautiful. Alice, did you have another question? No. Okay. So I'm going to lower your hand. Okay. Um, Rabbi, anything else? Well, you know, it's three and a half hours long, so we could go on longer, but- uh, Yes, we could. <laughs> we, could take, we could also, I'm gonna launch a poll. Yeah, which, I'm curious about- uh, Yeah, which movie did you like better? Cast a Giant Shadow or Exodus? Ooh, Exodus is, I need a few more people to vote here. Oh, I got one for Cast a Giant Shadow. <laughs> I, I think I may have made this unfair uh, by making uh, my my choice clear. I mean, just uh, as I talked about the director last week of Cast a Giant Shadow, a, a labor of love, but he was outpaced by his material in some ways. Uh, Otto Preminger uh, was a good enough director and a big enough director to uh, uh, to do do justice to it, um, but it could have been a half an hour shorter, I think. Yeah, um, I'm going to end the poll and then I'm going to share the results. All right, five people liked <clears throat> Cast a Giant Shadow. 
and 13. <coughs> like that. So, um, thanks, Vanessa. And that's always fun to know. And we can do this again in a couple of weeks after we see our next pair of movies. So uh, I believe uh, it's the jazz singer for next week, right? Right. So, and, and, and what, what year would that be from? Yeah, the original, 1927. Actually, I think there may have been a silent version, believe it or not. But, uh, but the 1927 version uh, starring Al Jolson, um, which actually is considered to be the first full-length talking movie. So it, it's a real piece of uh, cinema history, uh, as well as one of Jewish history. So. Um, so it can be found on Amazon Prime. I saw it on YouTube. Um, on Amazon Prime, to, to rent it is $1.99. Okay. And probably worth it. Yeah, definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. Yeah, okay, great. I have so, a question. Yes. I, yeah. or, okay. So, are the, Rabbi, could you give us some things to look for in the movie as we watch it? Um. So uh, a couple of things uh, to look for in, in the jazz singer. Of course, I mean, part of this is simply the fact that the first full length talking movie is the story about a cantor's son. Uh, I mean, I think that that's a really interesting thing. What, what does that say about the, the movie business in the 1920s? So we want to think about those things. The other thing uh, to look at uh, from a stylistic point of view is, is uh, try to follow the camera movement in, in this movie. Um, there, there's uh, um, the, the advent of sound brought with it some technical problems. Uh, and you'll see, I, I want you to see, does the, does the camera move uh, in the jazz singer, right? So, so watch how that sort of technical stuff is done in this. And, and to be honest, it's, it's fair to call this a silent movie with sound. Uh, rather than a sound movie. So if you, you want to pay attention to that too, silent sequences versus sound sequences and how that works. Okay. Um, I think that that's probably some organizing principles for you. Okay. Of course, the relationship between the Jewish son and the Jewish mother and the Jewish father uh, are very fertile ground for us to talk about next week. Have fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Enjoy, if, everyone. If, if you want, Thanks we have a few moments of uh, national solidarity today, starting at 4.15. You can join us by Zoom. At 4.30, uh, church bells around the country are going to peal. Uh, we obviously don't have a bell, but I brought my shofar. So at, at 4.30, we'll sound the shofar and invite all of you to uh, make noise at home as well uh, um, in memory of those we've lost during COVID-19. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.